the potential we have on this planet is exactly equal to the existential threat that we've created. In our inevitable belief of scarcity, we started to go after resources that were beyond our needs. And we look around at our socio-political system, our economic system, the education of children, we look at our social media, we look at all kinds of aspects of life today. And now in the last two years, we created more billionaires than ever at the cost of 300 million new families in poverty. And for that, we became the, the existential threat that would create the sixth extinction. For all of our intelligence, we had this original wound of scarcity and separation. We need to cry so hard as humanity right now for the beauty that we have missed. We need to dream a new dream. So here we stand at this beautiful pinnacle and we will expand beautifully and we will become something greater than ourselves when we go into our extinction, if we're listening. And so may we wake up and I hope that in a few decades we are sitting around a fire laughing over the simplicity of the life that emerged from the chaos of a disconnected humanity and the speed at which it all healed. At the last moment, we suddenly took a step back from the cliff edge and we ran into a new field of flowers. Hello, beautiful humans. Welcome back to the Know Thyself podcast, where every single week we get the honor and privilege to sit down with a brilliant mind and open heart and somebody who can share some of the lessons that they've learned in their life and allow us to drop into an expanded level of awareness to know ourselves and the world at deeper and deeper levels. My guest today, I am so looking forward to dropping in with. This is going to be a special podcast, no doubt. I feel they all are, but this one has a unique frequency in the time that we're doing this. He is a physician specializing in uh, hospice care, internal medicine, endocrinology. He is an educator, internationally recognized as being a thought leader on the microbiome in the aspects of health, disease, and food systems. He is somebody that I think has such a depth and knowledge in science, but also in conjunction with his own connection to spirit and source, which is a rare combination in this day and age. And it's with that, I feel like he has a unique capacity in helping us wake up to a lot of things, the state of the world, the course we are on as a species, and to the degree in which we've lost connection with ourselves. And so it's without further ado, Zach Bush, welcome to the show. Mm, glad to be here with you. So, so, so looking forward mm -hmm. to this, man. So um I just uh, been in preparation and also through the ethers and through mutual friends, being able to witness your spirit and the way that you show up online and in conversation is really special, man. And so I just, I see you and I'm so excited to co-create some magic today. Awesome. Glad to be alive again today. <laughs> <laughs> so good, man. So you've recently shared that you're, you feel like you're kind of coming to a big energetic loop or ending to a cycle mm -hmm. in your life. And I would love for you to share a little bit about that and how you feel it's also in combination with the state or cycle we're on as a species. Uh, if there's anything you want to touch on there, I think it'd be a great place to start. Mm. That's a good one. I don't know if I've ever started a podcast with that question. That's good. That's, I'm always <laughs> surprised when I get a new intro. <laughs> well done. Um, yeah, I think I am finishing up a long arc and it's manifesting in every area of my life. You know, the, when we start to allow death to occur in our lives, we find a really great freedom and start to emerge in a whole different aspect of the vibration of life emerging from us. And I think that's really been happening to me. I think that if there's a springtime uh, corollary, it's happening in my life now. You know, there's this long uh, run through the seasons. And I think there was many seasons, probably wrapped many times through springtimes in my life. But there's, there is a sense that journeys that have certainly taken the first you know century or half century of my life, the first, first 50 years has really been a, a pressure cooker of this human intellectual egoic model of achievement to run that as far as I possibly could and then feel that you know pendulum starting to swing back, starting around. I think it started swinging probably 08, 09, somewhere in there, but it didn't become, you know, completely evident until 2010 when my life clearly, you know, took a very steep turn. Mm -hmm. um, but the last 12 years has been a steady deconstruction of everything that I thought I held valuable and everything that I thought I was worthwhile or valuable for this world uh, had to fall away. And that means you have to die over and over and over and over again to yourself uh, and to the people that are around you too. And, 
And so I think anybody who's entered this space of surrender has realized that this is not a gentle process. It is certainly not a comfortable process. And it's one that is going to be extremely disruptive. And it's been disruptive in every area of my life. But my gosh, the beauty that has flown through and, and flowed through is just beyond my wildest dreams in 2008. You know, So you know you need to make a change because you're at the end point of something energetically. And then you let all of that start to die. And now I find myself in 2023 here with this this really beautiful experience of recognizing that everything that I thought I was letting go of was even just symptomatic of, of this deeper one thing. And and if I had to boil it down to the one thing that's coming to a long end of a loop, which might just be one lifetime long, but energy can either be destroyed or created. And so I have a feeling the energy that animates my biology right now has been around a very long time. And what that energy has done through the eons, I have no idea, you know, on the scale or vastness because I can only look at it through a human lens, in which case I'm going to project a human story on that eons old energy center. But I do have a sense that that thing has been around this, this sun before. And I have had distinct experiences in the last year in particular that have you know, exposed a, a memory within myself of, of things long past. And that has been re- really deeply rooting, reassuring to myself, you know, at a deep level that I belong here right now. And I think that that was an unspoken fear through much of my life is maybe I don't belong here. Maybe I don't belong into humanity. Maybe I don't fit. Maybe no, nobody's going to understand me. Maybe I can't understand everybody else. Maybe I'm not worthwhile. Maybe I can't do enough to be worthwhile. You know, these are the deep seated fears within, I think the human psyche itself that we all have to live a lifetime to, to deconstruct and free ourselves of. So there's that, that journey happening right now. But I also you know, look through the scope of human history in the somewhat perverted way that we know it. But nonetheless, that human history really speaks of recurring patterns of behavior that have repeated itself so many times. And it's so exciting to see the possibility that humanity is actually resetting the fundamentals on on why those patterns were repeating themselves, giving us the opportunity right now to break the pattern and to actually start new. And so in my own life, I feel that. I've fought through patterns of belief and insecurities and self-destructive awareness, self-destructive thoughts so many times now that I'm seeing more space between the words. I'm seeing more space between my doubts. I'm seeing more space between my my moments of total exhaustion and, and hopelessness. And in that space is an infinite possibility. And so I think that's the newness that I'm feeling. Mm. So beautifully said, man. I think that we're experiencing that constant state of contraction and expansion globally, as well as a species of humanity, you know, that constant death and rebirth and those that feel like the time has come to step into sharing um, their own process of surrender and how we can be a voice for humanity. I feel like if anybody fits here in this time uniquely, it's you because the capacity in which you have to share, like I said, with the connection that you have to your own source and your own spirit, but also how much wisdom you hold on really activating codes for for individuals uh, at large, I think is really, really special. So when you kind of zoom out and see the time we are experiencing on this planet right now as the human species, Um, what sticks out to you as like the potential extinction event that we could be very well facing and the flip side of the coin, the tremendous possibility that we have to transmute to a new way of existing. So I think you're very wise to put those on the flip side of a coin because they are inseparable. The potential we have on this planet is exactly equal to the existential threat that we've created as our human species has seen itself separate from nature. And I think that's the original wound. You know, we, we saw ourselves separate from nature immediately, therefore having to believe in scarcity, therefore having to create an ego to protect ourselves, therefore othering everything, therefore extracting everything, therefore destroying the world. And so this this simple progression of that original wound of we are separate from nature has played itself out. And in that reality of, of an existential threat coming to biology on Earth, we have created this potential. So what is... The, maybe we'll start with the existential threat, what happened. 
in our inevitable belief of scarcity, we started to go after resources that were beyond our needs. Because mm -hmm. we thought, well, maybe something else happens and I'll need something that I don't need right now. Or maybe my children will need something that I don't have right now because things get worse, so I need to get more to pass on to my kids. And we've created all kinds of constructs to prepare for this kind of phenomenon. And one that I was kind of unaware of because it seemed so good. In fact, it was my whole metric of value on this planet was I want to be a good husband and a great dad, you know. And so I, I've held that so vigorously and I, I've been, you know, 23 years of, uh, of marriage and everything else. Like there's such intense holding on to these identities and to find out that we actually created the construct of legal marriage so that we could pass on wealth to our children before that contract, which was a very Western contract, it was more, you know, commit with, without some sort of legal document that got governments involved in your <laughs> love life. It was a familial contract back in the day that was a lot more about, you know, let's let's build some, build a home together, let's build this nurture, and already it had a capacity for extract and extraction and all that. But I think when we took it to this legal document that was about passing on the paternal name rather than the maternal name, which was historically much more accurate to most you know, indigenous peoples, that patriarchal shift to, I want to make sure my wealth is passed down through my male line. And therefore, we're going to create this construct where women are owned through this marriage construct and lose their identity in this marriage construct. So this patriarchal Western view of it it's just one of the many things. And I think you could point to education same way. I think you could point to our economic system and find different, you know, realities. Of, oh, my gosh. It was out of this belief that there wouldn't be enough for our children <laughs> that we created all these constructs to be able to extract more than we could ever need, you know. And now in the last two years, we created more billionaires than ever in history at the cost of 300 million new families in poverty. And so never before have we demonstrated so well, that our pendulum is swinging so hard to this scarcity model that, you know, a billion dollars, a thousand million dollars, nobody can spend that much money on providing for themselves or their family. It's absolutely impossible. And so we've taken this to such an extreme abstraction of need. And then you see billionaires committing suicide for a lack of self-worth. You know, it's like, <laughs> Wow, a lack of self-worth or and a billion dollars of energy in the bank. Where did we go so wrong? So we did this on in every aspect, our from relationships to economics to our sociopolitics, built around the scarcity model. And in our constant separation from nature, and as that pendulum swang, we became that existential threat. And the extinction that you mentioned, you know, becomes real. So we're in the middle of the sixth great extinction. And it, it turns out this extinction is being caused for the exact same reason the last one was caused. 55 million years ago, we see a vast extinction event. 90% of life on Earth disappears in a matter of months or years. And what we find in the fossil record is this huge layer of dust that settled on all of the soils of the earth and cho choked out the respiratory function of, of the soils. And in losing our soil systems, we lost the, the biology of the planet. And it took millions of years to recover. But in the millions of years of recovery, a brand new potential for life was discovered. And this has been the story of every extinction is that when you put biology under stress, it immediately creates more opportunity for the future. And so at that last extinction, the earth was covered in ferns and palms. That was all the greenery on earth. The animals had, had summited or plateaued at reptiles. There was no dolphins in the in the ocean. There was no blue whales. There was you know no humans. There was no monkeys. You know that we we were done at reptile. And then a great extinction event happens, and the biology of those reptiles and every other creature on Earth, nematodes, earthworms, you know all of this, leave behind new potential and viruses. And so when we are genetically stressed, we start making new potential genetic possibility, and that's what we now call a virus. But long before there was an English word called virus, there was a genetic library on Earth. We now call this the virome, the global information bank of potential life. And the viruses are in their expression of new potential proteins there for the uptake of all biology left over. And so we see reptiles, you know, all the dinosaurs disappear permanently, a few reptiles survive. 
you know, crocodiles and a couple others, you know, so we get a few reptiles survive. But the 10% then of you know, genetic possibility on Earth starts taking up new viruses. And eventually you get to the birth of birds, mammals, humans. That was a 55 million year journey from extinction to human. And over that time, the viruses started getting taken up into a genetic possibility of live birth. And so it's so beautiful that the human genome, my genome is about 19,800 genes, which is a very tiny number because uh, I have over 400,000 proteins that are made by those 19,000 genes. And, and the old model from Watson and, and Crick was that you know, one DNA strand called a gene would go in and make one protein. Now we know one gene can make over 200 different proteins depending on the environment. And so the genetic code you inherit from your parents is just the possibility of who you become. Who you become is coded by the breath you take. And this is why I believe things like astrology are so powerful. Is It's literally the energetic environment you're born into that then demonstrates or, or creates the, the actual life from that potential template of the genome. But as we dive into Zach's 19,800 genes, you find out that 55% of those 19,000 are direct viral inserts into the genetic code. 8% of those are, are retroviruses like HIV. Hmm. And so here we are in modern medicine demonizing the very genetic language that makes life in, in its many forms possible. And if there's anything we learned from 4 billion years on, on Earth, it's that nature is pressing for biodiversity and adaptation is its code. The result of biodiversification is more adaptation and it's this feedback loop oh my gosh, we got more adaptation because we developed viruses 3 billion years ago. So suddenly everything started accelerating. Before that, we just had to share genes by touching each other. Suddenly we could send genes long distance and then everything kind of burst. You know? And so we went from, you know, it took a billion years to get the first fungi, you know, and then suddenly we get viruses and in the next billion years, we get all kinds of multicellular life and, and life just kind of goes berserk. And so the ability to communicate over distance was the breakthrough for biology and they did it through the viruses. And so here we are as a recent expression of mother nature. And we did that through the accumulation of 50, you know, 55 million years from last extinction, 4 billion from creation of the, of the planet. We are well into this, you know, beauty experiment that is life on earth. And right now we're, we're representing kind of one of the most extraordinary central processing units that biology has ever created, I meaning the most genetically pliable. We're more plastic than any other species out there in our genetic code, meaning we can absorb more information than any other single species has ever done. And we have the neural system to collect information energetically or neurologically from more species than any other uh, that's existed. And we do that through our colon. And so our colon is more biodiverse than any other piece of nature in the universe, as far as we know. So, you know, we are so intelligent for the amount of information we can take in. And we do that through a very unique colon that is, you know, has more neurologic connection than any other and has a, a very specific anatomy to it that allows for more biodiversity to occur there. And so we are ultimately, to date, the highest expression of planet Earth's entire intelligence in a single species. And for that, we became the, the existential threat that would create the sixth extinction because for all of our intelligence, we had this original wound of scarcity and separation. So what happened is that we perfected stress on earth. We figured out how to destroy her soil, her water, her air. And so last extinction killed her topsoils and then everything disappeared. So this one we started a couple hundred years ago with really aggressive, but a couple thousand years ago began the process of destroying our soils. Uh, and the first effort towards that was North Africa. And so Egypt and the, you know, the modern Egyptian you know, group of about 5,000 years ago, and then the Roman Empire about 2,000 years ago destroyed the soil system of North Africa and it became the largest desert in the world. Previous to the Romans, it was the largest rainforest in the world. You know, Roman history tells us that there, the Roman soldiers could march from one side of North Africa to the other without never seeing the sun because the tree canopy was so complete. And now there's not a tree in, in 14, you know, what is it, 8,000 kilometers. So, you know, it's like amazing how good we are at destroying soil systems. And so we are the asteroid of today. <laughs> we are the volcanic mm. event of today that will choke out her topsoils. 
And for that, we will put so much stress on this planet. And for that, there will be so many more viruses than have ever existed before. And because there's no more biodiversity now than there was 55 million years ago by a long shot. Yeah. And so when you put today's Earth under stress compared to 55 million years ago, it is logarithmically more intelligent from a, a genomic standpoint. But life on Earth needs carbon. It needs energy to be pumped through it. And to get that, you need CO2 in the atmosphere. And the other thing that we have done so well is getting CO2 at, into the atmosphere. Never before has there been so much carbon available to biology on Earth. And thank God for Shell, BP, ExxonMobil, because without them, we would not have gotten this carbon out of the center of the Earth where it was not available to biology anymore. So for the first time in a bio biology of four, million, 4 billion years, for the first time we have all of the Earth's carbon, 96% of it probably, available for life. And so we have more fuel for the biology of this planet to take off and more genetic potential than ever before. And every extinction has led to a more beautiful planet. You go from ferns and palms to wildflowers, deciduous trees. You go from reptiles to birds to mammals. You got blue whales swimming through the ocean today whose call to their child nearby will wrap the earth five times before that call dissipates. There's a vibrational experience on this earth that has never existed before, that is now queued up with more genetic potential and more carbon fuel for life to explode on this planet than ever before. This earth in a few million years is going to have the most extraordinary intelligence on it. And that could happen in 200 years if we stop the extinction now and stay to play. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, man. It's, there's just so much that you beautifully, articulately expressed. And I there's so many things that I want to touch on here, man. You just laid out the possibility for a transcendent mutation of the human species and the possibility that we have at foot. And also f the current paradigm of separation, fear, and scarcity, which we're often operating with, tends to lead us to myopically viewing disease through biological cause and effect. And I love how you're speaking to this expanded level of awareness that there are deeper energetic and some might say spiritual causes for the external manifestations that are at hand. And that is what I love to also hear you speak into is like the deeper journey. You've zoomed out and looked at previous extinction events. And I think we as humans can get so focused on not only our own uh, ego-driven lives, but then also like the the decade or century that we're living in, which is so small compared to the vast continuum of time and space. Um, but where do you feel like energetically, like energetically the causes for what is, is about to happen? Uh, what do you feel like those causes are? And what do you feel when you feel into the potential, the possibility for where this can go and the new evolution of life's intelligence evolving, what does that look like? Because it's very, very exciting. So there's an energetic side to that and there's a biologic side to that. Um, the energetic side is definitely the emotional state that you just spoke of. And emotion is a human construct, obviously. And so we could to speak a little deeper about just vibration, right? So the, the vibration of fear, guilt, and shame are the things that are driving our extinction behavior. And so these vibrations set up a fear paradigm at the genetic level, at the neurologic level, at the endocrine level, which is to say your hormones, um, as well as you know, more subtle forms of energetics and things like that. But biologically, you're responding to these vibrations of energy of fear, guilt, and shame at the genetic level. And we can show this in humans, but we can also show it in plants. You know, So uh, you can put something similar to an EKG monitor onto this moss, for example. And when I walked into the room, if if you'd had this thing hooked up to an EKG, it would have responded electrically to my state of being. And so I could project anger, fear, shame on this moss of like, why are you in this room? You're like completely isolated from nature. Like, why did you leave the tree that you were birthed under? Like, what are you doing in here? You know, just 
you can literally use English to talk to this plant and it will respond by in a vibrational response of stress for the vibration I'm putting out. So obviously it's not understanding my words, it's understanding the vibrations that are under those words. And I think for that reason, the moss is more aware of human status than the human is because we don't actually understand that our words are coming from an energy of emotion all the time. Uh, maybe sometimes we're aware of it, but it's so subtle and so ever present that these energies, these vibrational experiences are shaping the world around us. Instead, if I'd be like, man, I am so grateful you are in this room. I can't believe you are willing to to grow here in this room outside of nature so that you could bring a message of love of earth into a man-made environment such that when I breathe in here for the next hour, I'm going to be getting genetic information from you as you release that into the atmosphere. I'm going to sit here and breathe you in and I'm going to be, I'm going to leave here more moss than I was when I came in here. And I'm so grateful for you to give me that opportunity to expand my beingness, to be more moss-like, to be more connected to my nature. This wall of moss is now completely vibrating at a different level. And so we show these things through energetics or, you know, the, the impedance or electrical activity within the plant. And so the existential threat or what's underneath this ex existential threat of humanity is vibrational experiences that resulted from this original wound of abandonment. And fortunately, there are some prophecies that have, are kind of playing out now that some of them are hundreds of years old, some of them more recent, that are saying that in this decade we're in, 2017 to 27, somewhere in that range, um, some would point to more like a 25-year, one-generation change that started in 2012. But suffice it to say, we're in the midst of the end of everything of the last epoch, which is, again, debated 50,000 years, 70,000 years, 100,000 years. Somewhere in that 50 to 100,000 year range, there's an energetic endpoint. There's a close of a season happening, and there's a beginning of the next. And there's a gap of what I would call a, a um, vector of energy during this little shift. And so for the last 50,000 years, we've been on a vector of energy, which is, you know, take this fear, guilt, shame thing, this separation from nature. We'll screw you, nature. If you're against us, we're going to do it to you first. You know, we're going to get you better. We're going to manage you. We're going to squeeze more food out of you. We're going to squeeze more oil out of you. We're going we're gonna to get the upper hand because you screwed us over. You abandoned us. So this kind of juvenile, you know, three-year-old behavior of humanity of like, whoa, I get my way, you know, <laughs> that that's been our vector for the last you know 50,000 years and we've seen the collapse of civilization again and again in that 50,000 year you know 100,000 year epoch and so now we're lacking a vector we have so played that story out and now we just see this morass and we look around at our socio-political system we look around at our economic system we look around at the education of children we look at our social media we look at all kinds of aspects of life today and we just throw up our hands like oh my god this is a absolute shitstorm. There's no way we can sort this out until we go extinct. Like, and you look at the timelines of the extinction patterns of the biology, we have like eight years to save the oceans. I, I mean, look at the American presidency coming up again. Same two dudes. It's going to be Trump and Biden again. Like, like, what are we doing? Like eight years from now, how could anything change if we're still playing out this, this end of this patri patriarchal polarized sociopolitical system? And the answer gets at kind of what you mentioned earlier, which is, whoa, did you just say there's a phase change about to happen? That there's potential we could actually create a completely different biology? And that's this silver lining that I wake up with, this, this little smile on my face every morning with this sense of hope of like, oh my gosh, people. We, we have nothing to fear because we only have opportunity. And those prophecies are saying that in this little metamorphic, zone of everything dissolving in the cocoon, but the butterfly hasn't shown up yet, in that moment, we will lose the genetics of fear, guilt, and shame. Hmm. Now there's some opportunity. The second our biology forgets fear, guilt, and shame is the second that we can express to completely a new biology. And I'm so excited by that possibility. And I am so sure that nature has positioned herself perfectly 
to ignite that opportunity for us. And she is just full of grace for sure. But beyond grace, she's full of excitement to re-express herself more beautifully with more biodiversity, with more intelligence, with more grace and beauty than has ever existed here. And, and so we sit here and a linear transformation, no way, we, yeah. we go extinct. A complete metamorphic transformation, butterfly coming out of that cocoon is what we have to do now. And I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful that we can't figure out like, is there an economic model to recover the US dollar? <laughs> no, there's not. <laughs> US dollar's dead. There's no way we can recover that. So what do we need to do? Okay, so what if fiat currency needs to go away? So we tried crypto, which is a very bizarre perturbation or maybe the, the ultimate bastardization of anything of value, depending on your perspective. But <laughs> the the reality is we are sensing that the, the, the things that have dictated our recent world are coming to an end and we're trying to imagine what comes next. And so I, I, I'm so excited about you know, those people running around with blockchain ideas and crypto ideas and all this stuff because they're 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 the plow in the ground where, you know, they would have been killed 25 years ago for thinking of something other than the Fed, you know. So, yeah. you know, I, I'm excited that even the Fed now is like, well, we should make our own cryptocurrency. It's like, probably not, but <laughs> congratulations for thinking outside of your box, you know. So <laughs> so I, I think that it's it's just telling. The crypto story has been so telling okay, we really are fundamentally ready for the complete newness. And it's okay that it looks like a complete, you know, you kind of chase your tail loss right now on crypto rise and fall and whatever is going to happen next after crypto and these things. All of that needs to happen. And the more we all just participate, I've never bought a crypto thing in my life, but I've been able to participate in a lot of conversations around it that I think are as important as participating in this economics of it. Let's let's participate in the philosophy of it. Everybody now needs to participate in the philosophy of newness, in the philosophy of a, a unified vision for where we're going. And for that, we need to lose fear. And I'm seeing this pattern be. I guess this is you know vulnerably speaking, this is the thing that diffuses all my hope and joy the fastest and most consistently is people working around me with teams or whatever start to imprint the past experiences on the now you know and then i just start to lose hope i'm like people like all we're talking about is the fact that it can be without the past but i'm watching the past completely blow apart teams i'm watching the past you know blow apart momentum there's 1.5 million orgs that are now 1.5 million nonprofits in the space of ecology climate change social you know justice all these things and yet nothing is shifting you know you look around and it's like well is anything really being moved by by a million and a half that are raising hundreds of billions of dollars a year why isn't working because they are imprinting the past on the now still and the main thing that and you know nonprofits tend to do is run in the scarcity mentality around money. And so until we really truly believe in abundance model, we will continue to blow each other apart. And the closer we are to each other, the closer we are to shared, you know, space, shared responsibility, the more likely we will create chaos in those spaces. So I think we saw this in the pandemic. The nuclear family blew up. It was appropriately named nuclear stuff is holds so much potential energy that when you when you allow the nuclear to go nuclear, it is so destructive. We saw more suicides in homes ever before in two years. We saw more domestic violence, more violence on women and children than has ever happened in history. We saw more substance abuse than has ever happened in history. And so this happened in these last couple of years because I feel like we're we're in that death throes of imprinting the past onto the now and therefore screwing up the momentum of the future. <laughs> and so I start to become a little hopeless at moments when I see those that are most vision aligned, most passionate, most energetic to change the world, imprinting the, the now with the past and, and watching my own inability to prevent that from happening and my own inability to get it back on track quickly, you know, yeah. to diffuse the, the energy and my own inability to keep those tendencies out of myself. And so this is this is the great test, I think. Is can we really wipe the slate clean?
can we stop projecting the past on today and be the new thing? Yeah, man, you raise a lot of really important questions about one, on such a global level, how we've diminished our own sensitivity. I'm here for the Zach and Moss love story, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And it's um, it's unfortunate that the vast majority of humans have lost the connection to nature and the ability to listen to plants and animals speaking to us and being able to feel connected with them. Because without that level of awareness, we're going to try to keep controlling the pieces of the game we're in, thinking that's going to be the solution to our problems, not realizing we're playing the wrong game in the first place. When there's so much shame, fear, and guilt that are operating behind human consciousness right now. What you're sharing is that transcendent possibility of being in the cocoon for everybody that totally believes they're a caterpillar, they're not going to want to, they're going to hold on to not dying so much because they don't see what's on the other side. When you're having a deeper clarity and you can find the, find the stillness and silence within, you see the possibility of what's happening on the other side of death, which is more life, then it becomes an exciting journey to embrace and not something to have so much fear and resistance around. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. I, <laughs> my... My ex-wife and mother, my kiddos, and she's one of my best friends now. And she, she taught me such beauty in the in the twenty years we were together. She's an artist and incredible observer of nature, and uh, she would take our kids out and homeschooling them and and have them do nature journals. And she was the one that brought to our attention that right before the caterpillar went in to create its cocoon, uh, she had collected you know the caterpillars. Uh, for the monarch butterfly with the kiddos. And she pointed out that right before the, that caterpillar forms the cocoon around it, the head of the caterpillar drops off mm. and doesn't end up in the cocoon. <laughs> wow. I'm like, oh my gosh, if there's a <laughs> lesson we must learn as humans is we need to get rid of the head before it gets into the mess of the cocoon. Mm. We do not want the mind to be part of our new expression in the sense that, we, that all of that memory, all the emotional trauma must be let go or else the butterfly cannot emerge. Mm. If, if the cognitive dissidence that has been the split human mind is carried forward, we will, we will not be here for the next expression of life on earth. And so can we lose our head before we, before we completely dissolve and therefore express the new thing? And so this is our challenge uh, to one another. I think that what we need to do ultimately sit around fire in silence in the dark hold hands in that space and stop telling stories because right now it's the stories of humanity that have perpetuated our reality and we need to dream a new dream out of the silence and that silence if you've ever experienced it in nature is so loud there is so much happening there and my favorite thing uh, about growing up in Colorado was uh, I was very fortunate to get into an extraordinary uh, troop of Boy Scouts that were typical Boulder Colorado com had absolutely only anti kind of the anti-establishment attitude in those 18 boys that grew up together and we had such radical experiences in nature together it was so dangerous the silly stuff we did we were in you know minus 19 degree weather camping in completely unprepared conditions like we just had crappy gear and everything else and we're now 50 degrees below freezing and we spit ourselves dry that night we were so so dehydrated in the morning because we couldn't stop spitting because at 50 degrees below zero your spit freezes right before it hits the ground so you could spit at a rock and you could hear your spit pink off of the <laughs> the thing because it was already an ice cube but by, by the time it hit the hit the stone and so we were spitting and laughing all night long and just having a freaking ball and then we finally went to sleep probably 2 o'clock in the morning or something as, as boys will be, do as they're left alone. And I had to get up to pee, which wasn't typical for me at that time zone of my life. I could usually not pee for 12 hours, but I hadn't peed in 12 hours. 
and but had to get up at three o'clock in the morning and I was scared to go outside because suddenly you're 13 years old and it's pitch dark and you, know, you think it's going to be scary. You finally get out of your tent and I walked out into this winter paradise of white snow at three o'clock in the morning with everybody sleeping around me. And it was the first time in my life that I truly felt independent. And I was suddenly this being on top of this mountain at you know, 10,000 feet above sea level in, in these frigid cold levels. And when it's minus, you know, 19, 50 degrees below freezing, everything is holding still. Like nothing can move in that temperature. And so the silence was just deafening. And then I looked up and the stars were right on top of me. Like mm -hmm. when you're at that altitude and that level of cold, there's no humidity in, that, in Colorado to begin with. And you make it that cold and there's literally no interference in the visual phase between the Milky Way and your eyes. And I felt like I was falling into the Milky Way or I was a part of it. And at 13, and I think that was one of the moments my life pivoted and... I suddenly got a glimpse of who I am and it was much bigger than I had ever perceived before. And I felt this hugeness in me and I felt this huge vastness in nature. And then I heard so much and it was like, suddenly my ears were just like overwhelmed by the noise of the silence. And I felt like I could hear the vibration of the stars. I felt like I could hear the, the breath of some squirrel in some frozen tree nearby. And like, there was just so much happening around me in this utter silence. And that's what we're gonna have to do together is we're gonna have to fall into these spaces where we are become so aware of the silence between human activities, between human thoughts, between human memories, and have the humility to stop telling human stories, to listen into the story of the moss. And what is the moss gonna tell us if we listen, you know, and uh, I believe if our extinction becomes complete, it will be the most beautiful of hospice journeys, which I have seen many of. I've seen many, many beautiful, you know, settings down of the body and there's never an end point. It's always a rebirth. It's always an expansion and we will expand beautifully and we will become something greater than ourselves when we go into our extinction, if we're listening. My concern, if I have one right now for our extinction, is not that we're going to, you know, perhaps decide to go down that path and, and complete this journey into extinction. It's that we're going to do that path and not be awake and not be listening and therefore not learn from the journey. And that would be a disrespect to the 200,000 years of Homo sapiens that have come before us. And so may we wake up if for no other reason, for the sake of the ancestors, if for no other reason for the children that could come if we don't go extinct. Let us think about our position in human history for a moment with a sense of opportunity, not just gravity, but opportunity to listen beyond ourselves, to stop listening to the egoic narratives of humanness and start to listen to nature's story. And it's going to be a spectacular, spectacular awakening as all hospice journeys are and uh it's a relief it's a relief i want all of you to know it's just going to be beautiful no matter what and it will be more beautiful if we do it with a lot more silence and a lot more reverence for the observation of nature around us and then there gets to be this beautiful point in every hospice journey where suddenly nobody's concerned about living anymore and they just want to be right here right now and every breath becomes uber present. And when you walk into the room with somebody who is staring into the face of their loved one, maybe for the first time in their lives present, everybody cries because there's so much beauty coming through that person. And they might be nonverbal at that point, but my God, the presence in their eyes, you feel like you can fall into their eyes, into the cosmos itself, right through their eyes because they are so still at that moment and they are so aware, taking in the face and every detail on their loved one at that moment. And that presence becomes this gravitational force and you suddenly can start to feel space-time bending and suddenly that next breath feels like it's a, a year away and suddenly that person's living a whole lifetime because they are in this moment seeing more beauty in the human face before them than they ever did in watching that child birth from them, grow up, birth their own kids, whatever that 80 year journey has borne, 
that last couple seconds is suddenly they see the beauty of everything and they're so tuned in and so amazed by what they see. And you can sense all of that just being in, you know, witness to this observation, witness to a being that is seeing the full beauty of another human at that moment. And for that, seeing their own beauty and realizing their path was perfect, no matter how broken or failed they thought it was a few minutes ago, they realize it was all beautiful. I am beautiful. My journey was perfect. And I am part of a tapestry of humanity that's marching us to a new expression of energy that can neither be destroyed or created. It is just here. The energetics of 7.8 billion souls is here right now. And it's vibrating. And if we take the time to look into another face, it said that if we look into another's eye for two minutes, we will fall in love. That is to say that you will see their beauty. That's what falling in love is, is that you suddenly see beauty and the reaction to seeing beauty is a vibration that we have come to call love. And I think it takes far less than two minutes to make that thing happen. I think it takes two minutes to shut down your freaking brain and shut down some of your you know, insecurities of actually looking at somebody. But it only takes a millionth of a second to actually be still enough to see it. And then the love is greater than it's ever been in your life. That's a discipline that is, you know, fast coming to its necessity for humans to stay in play. Can we look into each other's face? Launch, shut the fuck up and just look at each other. You know, and that's hard for me because not only am, is my whole career been about what comes out of me, the words I have, the medical knowledge I have, my personal metrics were that I would give somebody else something. And I, if I wasn't leaving somebody more enriched by the exchange, then what was I worth? And so we're so used to only being valuable if we're doing that, that we can't be still. And it's very hard for me to have enough self-respect and self-love to really become still before somebody. Because to do that is just coming to a reverence of realizing you are a sovereign being and I can do nothing to bring you into a higher state of being because it all is from source. Whatever energy is animating your body is in absolute perfect relationship to your biology. And if it's not, it's probably because somebody is doing something to it. So all we can really do is take each other out of coherence with self out of coherence with our full power. So to actually witness somebody is to completely give up the belief that you can make their life better, that you can somehow love them. I don't know if we even love each other. I think we can love energetics of being here right now. And relationship is a powerful way to bring yourself into the present moment and stare into a mirror until you become still relationships tend to blow apart when we can't be still and we continue to do stuff to one another energetically. And so it's a very interesting moment that we're in. So strange that to survive, all we have to do is stop doing. So strange that all we have to do to fall in love is to be witness to somebody rather than know them or convince them that we're important to them or offer something to them. <laughs> it's just, I, I can tell you that uh, it is something I have not perfected yet. And I'm on a journey to find it myself because those prophecies are telling us this decade, somebody's going to freaking do it. Somebody's going to phase change. And I don't really care if it's me or not, but I sure want to be part of that that vortex of energy spinning closer and closer to that moment so that somebody will pop. Hmm. And uh, when two people finally can see each other, the vibration of love on this planet at that moment between those two beings will catapult us into this new expression, new biologic expression, new genetic expression, new energetic expression, everything else, because they finally saw each other up until this moment with these egoic minds, all we can really see is a reflection of ourselves and we can fall more in love with ourselves when we look at each other. And that's an important journey, not to diminish that. That is the journey towards this other moment we're talking about, but it's not the same as seeing the other person. Yeah. And so to 
really become visible to one another. We're going to have to come into complete vibrational coherence with self. And that's much bigger than trying to do self-love. It's self-expression. You want to you go into the next phase? Self-expression. How do you do that? It has to be embodied because souls have been doing this forever. Souls connect to everything all the time. Everything. Energetically, they are connected to everything. There is singularity. There is oneness. So the, whatever energy field is animating me has been doing connection to everything forever. Yeah. The challenge is, can the biology that's being animated by that thing come into complete coherence so that it can do the phase shift? And so for all the words I'm saying right now, there's a temptation to think, oh my gosh, I got to figure out what he's saying. Or I need to figure out what, the, what I think about anything he's saying. When in reality, it's no, it has nothing to do with any words or any thoughts. It has to do with literally like the, this. Like, can I get my legs, my, the bottom of my foot, to pay attention to source so much that it is the full expression of whatever vibration coming down through there? And so it becomes the full expression of that vibration. And right now, I'm so up in my head at any given moment of being Zach that my feet aren't animating the full expression of that because there's so many layers of emotional interference mm. between the original beam of original math and my toes. The layers are dense. The biggest one may be right here at the base of my lungs, which is unprocessed grief. Why do I think that's one of the biggest ones? Because change triggers grief. And the only thing nature does all the time is change. And we haven't come to terms with that. We resist change in every possible way. That's why we, we create schools, you know, the way that we do. Learn this stuff and you'll, you'll know everything you ever need to know. You know, learn human history and, and it won't be repeated, you know. And so it's this, this externalization of, of reality that we start to do in education. Or we do it, in, and again, in, in relationship. Well, I've got an idea. Let's go into a contract that says the whole world will be defined by us. We will, until we die, we will agree that nothing will change between us. We'll make sure that we, we are the box for love and we're going to hold it in there. And all physical expression of love, all emotional expression of love, we'll, we'll, we'll start here and end here first, you know. And then we find out that, you know, we're not really capable of surviving that contract because nature is just changing all over the place and we're resisting it we're resisting it we're clinging to each other like hey you you still like the same netflix show right well so do i so let's keep it here let's let's hold on to that one commonality that's the last thing we can think of that we actually agree on or we actually but let's hold on to that because if we let go then change is going to happen And so this is the extraordinary thing is that humans have been resisting change since our origin, perhaps. And for that, we have so much unprocessed grief. And for that, the original vibration of an energy field, field that's trying to get down to my toes stops here at my mid chest, disrupts halfway my, the energy field of my heart, you know. And so the heart can't even, you know, clear blood out of it before it's in an in a void of the original math. And now it's just translating the emotions of unprocessed grief into my body as the aorta, which comes right out of my heart, goes plunging right down through grief. That's the first vibration that that blood coming down that huge pipeline of the aorta is going to see is unresolved grief. Now go feed that to the body. Mm -hmm. Why do we have fear, guilt, and shame as such prominent stories that we love to take up? Because we're interpreting the whole world in unprocessed grief. So it's time to change and it's time to let go of the belief that we shouldn't grieve. We need a freaking ball. We need to cry so hard as humanity right now for the beauty that we have missed, for the beauty we have tortured, for the beauty that we have extracted from this earth, for the numbers of times in the last week that I've walked by a tree and not said thank you. It's embarrassing. For all the biology I know, for all of the things I think, I can't believe I was able to get from my car into your place here without stopping at the trees between. That is so narcissistic. It is so short-sighted. It is so missing the beauty of this earth. I was in a conversation with a colleague on my way here about just the frustration of trying to keep humans together on a path, you know. And if I just shut up 
and just looked at the trees all the way here, I would have stepped in here with a much higher vibration for this moss to enjoy. And so I want to tell you all how frail I am. I want to tell you how difficult it is to live a transformed life when we have unprocessed grief that our blood is pumping through. And so I can tell you all that I have not cried enough. I have not emptied myself out of the human grief that is carried forward in me from 40 generations past. I have not done my work to ask for forgiveness. I have not done it enough. And so what does 2023 look like for all of us? As we start this year, people, we need to get it out. We need to empty the playing field of this energetic body that is a, a column of water that remembers every emotion that's ever occurred. We need to clear the water structure. We need to erase the memory of humanity from our water structure long enough for us to immediately express a new biology. We will take up so many new viruses instantaneously when given the genetic space for it. Right now, every cell in my body is screaming terror, extinction, separation. Nobody understands you, Zach. Nobody gets you. Nobody thinks you're beautiful. Nobody can do this or that. Like we got this stuff at the genetic level pumping through us, clogging up the metrics and the matrix of, of the machinery of genetic expression. Right now in my bloodstream, though, I have 10 to the 15, which is to say about 100 billion viruses coursing through my bloodstream right now. 100 billion different viruses, which is to say 100 billion new genes that my biology could take up in a moment if I will step out of my fear, guilt, and shame. Who am I going to be tomorrow if I can eliminate the filter of unresolved grief? Who am I going to express tomorrow? Which is to say in the next millionth of a second, because it turns out that all biology disappears and reappears every millionth of a second because it's not actually made of cells, it's made of atoms. And that quantum physics stuff that governs atoms is really annoying to study because it just proves that the human mind is so infantile in really seeing and understanding the beauty of what we hold within us and around us. We are so far beyond the beauty of the cosmos all in this one vessel, you know. And so we are disappearing and reappearing every millionth of a second to express something new. And we keep imprinting the past on that next millionth of a second. So it looks like we're living a, a linear life of decline when in fact we're living a quantum physics potential for complete newness every millionth of a second. Why am I carrying forward the emotions of yesterday? How is it even possible? It's because the mind is so good at keeping things just a few seconds longer. This brain only has one thing that, that takes care of memory. It's this little tiny P in the, in the temporal lobe called the hippocampus. It's literally smaller than my pinky finger's nail. This little spot holds memory for seven seconds. Maybe some people would say a couple hours at max. But within seconds, the emotional memory is gone from that space. But seven seconds is a freaking eon to cells that are made of atoms that are disappearing every millionth of a second. So we've been given a neurology that can hold on to memory just long enough to keep bringing the last experience forward. And for that, we keep dying faster and faster, more and more separated from nature, more and more desperate with each generation. And so the head of the caterpillar must fall off. And so this is where meditation comes in. This is where the whole field of mindfulness comes in as powerful tools. And I've gone down that rabbit hole pretty hard with my patients and I the last you know, 12 years after leaving academia and really trying to create an integrated medicine center. In the end, I have found that you know, there's so few tools that really can erase the memory of the past and they are all vibrational. And so the call of the blue whale is a big one, I would say. Go immerse yourself in the oceans and tune in and to silence until you feel like you can sense the, that call of the blue whale echoing through you. Uh, sound therapy is a very potent tool that's been perfected by indigenous cultures all over the world for you know hundreds of thousands of years. And so tap into sound as a powerful vibration. But we also started this podcast with three great breaths. 
And there's nothing more accessible to you when it comes to resetting vibration than breath. And so I'd say breath, sound, and nature are the three things to immerse yourself in to erase that seven-second memory of emotions and to erase maybe the couple hours of, of memory that you have in more the analytical brain side. And so you just need a few hours of complete silence at the brain level to leave that mind behind to come out of the cocoon new in that next millionth of a second. And so there's fortunately a lot of modalities that are coming about right now. Like I'm, you know, a huge fan of fasting and do this all the time with my patients because it turns out that fasting is this powerful way to come into silence through the biology inside of you. You have like, you know, 1.4 quadrillion bacteria inside of your bowels and skin, you know. And so when you're dealing with a quadrillion bacteria that are constantly being asked to metabolize food, it takes about 14 hours for a typical American meal to get through the, the gut and you're eating three of those a day. And so there is no silence in the soil systems of the human that's constantly eating. And for that, you're always in a, in a fight or flight state in the modern, common modern food system because every bite of food and every drink of water is carrying glyphosate and molecules of toxins of all sorts and everything else. And so you're poisoning your body a few times a day and you have a microbiome screaming to try to transmute all the toxins and try to get the metabolic thing going on. So you, your whole genomics are in fight or flight state with every single meal and you don't stop and you just keep loading it on and loading it on. And if you're stressed, you even eat more or you eat more of the wrong things, especially you drink more alcohol, you do the things, you know, like, so you're poisoning your body even faster under stress. So fasting is this incredible way to allow the soil to rest. And if any farmer knows their craft, they know they need to let the soil rest if it's going to keep giving life. And so you have to have a fallow year somewhere in the mix, you know, every seven years you got to reset that's, that's a piece of soil. I believe that every seven breaths, we'd be smart to reset. You know, And so we need a pattern of life in which we create these long periods of rest. And so fasting is a powerful tool. And, it, and you can do this really cognitively in seven seconds, really. Like just bring yourself into silence. You're between meals and you suddenly get that little spur of like, oh, I'm hungry. That's just a hormone that's, you know, basically keeping you out of a, a fight or flight relationship to, to starvation that you have come to believe in. And so you think a little bit of hunger means like there might be a, a famine setting in, you know, <laughs> and so we overreact to these things. And so next time you're just simply hungry, take seven seconds, just sit with that sense of hunger and be like, oh my gosh, this is, this is my body recognizing that for a moment it's silent. So instead of stuffing something in my mouth right now, I'm just going to enjoy the signal from my body that's it's ready for more, but we're not going to give it more right now because we're going to listen instead. And you're going to listen into the biology beneath the surface and start to ask it, what, what do you actually want tomorrow, today? What's actually going to make your soils more fertile? What's actually going to grow a stronger tree out of that soil? And uh, you might find out that in those few seconds of silence, it's actually not asking for more food. It's asking for a break from some emotion that's the dominant you know, function that's driving your macro behavior. Your gut is where you process emotion ultimately and um, your gut is a tortured place right now. And that's why their you know, number one complaints in primary care doctor's offices are typically you know, irritable bowel syndrome, bloating after meals, sensitivity to every single food on the planet. You know, We've created all of these in the just last 30 years. And so uh, we have a tortured soil within us. That is a direct reflection of the tortured soils of the earth that are now poisoned by 4 billion pounds of glyphosate annually around the world. 85% uh, of our rainfall, 85% of the water we drink is contaminated with this molecule glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in the famous weed killer Roundup. And uh, with 4 billion pounds of that chemical in our food system, water system, everywhere else, uh, we are seeing the death of biology on a, on a grand scale. And most of the extinction that I was talking about earlier with, uh, is really tied back to this molecule because it's a potent antibiotic, antifungal, antiparasite. And so it, it sterilizes everything it touches uh, in regards to the microbiome. And sterility, we now know, is the end of life on Earth. Without the microbiome, we have no other life form on earth. 
And so we are using 4 billion pounds of an antibiotic into our food systems globally. And for that, we have sterilized 97% of the soils of the earth. 97% of the farmable, arable soils of the earth are now extremely depleted or depleted of nutrients due to the, the end of the microbiome within it. And so we are desertifying. We are creating desert across a green planet that one time breathed. And we're killing the lungs of the planet now with this molecule. And for that, there's great silence on the earth. So just as, as the story with you know the genetics like, and the carbon. So thank God for all the CO2 in the atmosphere. Thank God for all the new viruses. Thank God also for the death of soils, for the silence that that might demand of the biology left behind so that it can co-imagine the next iteration of life on earth. Do we want to do it? Do we want to stay and play? I, we, I think we need to release judgment on the answer to that because maybe it's okay to recycle at this point. Like maybe we should all agree to let go. And there's indigenous cultures that are doing this. There are definitely, you know, tribes down there in the, in the Australian bush who a few decades ago decided they would stop procreating and would fade into the sunset of Australia as an aboriginal people with a 40,000 year oral history. They realized it was the end of their epoch and they stopped procreating. That's sobering people. They saw it coming and they stopped having children. The same thing is happening to wisdom keepers around the world. We're told that we are in the midst or in the presence of the last Dalai Lama. We're told that we're in the presence of, you know, the, the death recently of the last wisdom keeper with the, with the right birthmark that was born to the sand people with a 100,000 year oral history, passed away just before the pandemic, having predicted the pandemic, by the way. He, he explained exactly what was going to happen on earth in 2020, and he passed away. The last of the line of 100,000 years, the last of the line, line of the Dalai Lamas, the last of the line of an Aboriginal people that stop procreating because they understand the end of an epoch and they, and they go about the end of the epoch without any emotional judgment. Like, oh, this is just the end. We'll walk into the sunset into our energetic expression next. No hard feelings, no sense of failure. So this is okay. This is okay for us to do this. And so maybe not just the head of the caterpillar, but the whole caterpillar needs to fall out of the biologic mix uh, so that we don't take human behavior into the next expression of intelligence on the, on the planet. But I can tell you it's possible to do it because I get to see it in clinic. I get to see it on the farms that we work with. Five years ago, I launched Farmer's Footprint with a bunch of colleagues that are amazing. And uh, Farmer's Footprint was the first expression of our nonprofit called Project Biome, which is re-envisioning soil, water, and air systems to support the new life, the new earth. And what I can tell you is that the rate of healing that happens in a human body when it disconnects from that traumatic past and re-expresses something new, the speed at which a field will express new life and nutrients is so blindingly fast and abundant and beyond your your expectations with just a moment of rest so for a human i think it's down to seconds for a field it's down to a single season of rest stop spraying and plowing for just the fall and then let the spring take its own course and you can't believe the healing that happened in that brief moment 30 years of invasive weeds that were Roundup resistant and taking over the farm and destroying the economy of the farm, they just don't show up because they're no longer needed because the weed was there to heal a wound. It wasn't the problem. It was the healer. The viruses, people are not the problem. It is the potential of life expressed newly. The CO2 is not the cause of global warming. It is the fuel for the new earth. So here we stand at this beautiful pinnacle of opportunity, of expression, and we know that healing and the grace of nature is so far beyond the speed of injury that we know we can stay to play if we choose. And so we clearly have a choice now. And I have struggled all my life with this question of do we have free will? And I don't know if in the human mind we have free will but I know that we have freedom of choice. I don't know if we make that choice 
from a space of complete, complete free will, but we do have freedom of choice and our choice will be shaped by the silence that we hold together. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> Outside of that, perhaps being one of the most profound monologues I've heard in my 26 year old life, <laughs> um, I'm just reminded of, of many things that I feel are activated within the cells of my body, but then also that I'd like to share just that if, you know, a, a real change in our reality is to come from a change of our perception. And I just felt the Im immense amount of beauty of what you just shared, that anything we look at or hear has the capacity to overwhelm us with beauty if we allow it to. And hmm. I definitely was overwhelmed with the beauty of what you just shared. And I think the invitation that you've been sharing to let go and to allow that process of beauty and joy to take hold of us is a really beautiful one. What you spoke to with Buckminster Fuller has, you know, the saying of building new models that render the previous models obsolete. And I think you're speaking to a new era of where Thich Nhat Hanh has shared that the new Christ Buddha isn't necessarily going to be an individual, but a group, a sangha, a community of heart-centered leaders that can have this awareness that we hold to walk into building this new earth together. And I feel that possibility so much there that the, org the energy needs, need, just needs to be organized for the minds and the hearts to come together in silence like you spoke to. And then to tap back into life's intelligence, which is far more exponentially vast than we could ever intelligently think our minds have the capacity for and to tap back into that nature's intelligence and then to see what answers nature has for us because it has all the answers for us. So you're doing well at 26. <laughs> doing well, my friend. I think if you have the capacity to be overwhelmed by beauty at any age, you're you are living life to its fullest. To be overwhelmed, you have to be aware. You have to be present. Too many of us believe that we're overwhelmed right now, but we're not actually overwhelmed. <laughs> and so too, there's too much stagnancy in the human being disconnected from source to actually be overwhelmed. The type of overwhelm you're talking about requires an immense amount of presence. You're talking about an overwhelm that resets the codes in the water in every one of your 70 trillion cells. You're talking about an overwhelm that erases the relevance of every story ever heard before. <laughs> and so this is our challenge. Can we become so aware that we become so overwhelmed that every thought ever had in human history becomes obsolete and Buckminster's vision comes true, that the new world is instantly so obvious, so dumbfoundingly simple that we all move into the I am state. I am valuable. I am beautiful. I am vibrant. I am light and I can transmit the vibration of love as long as I'm aware of the beauty. And so this is this amazing, amazing moment. And it could not get me more excited that you in your third decade of life have created a forum that moves out to people all over the earth to set a vibration in motion to share a new space that a new dream would be had, that a new narrative would spring forth. And so I commend you not just on your platform here, but on the many platforms you've helped others create. You are creating virtual fire pits all over the place for humans to come around and have conversation. This is a sacred mission. Let nobody diminish what you have done. It is extremely vital for our future 
that we come around the fire together and create space held between two souls, even better, more. And so you've created virtual fireplaces for millions of people to join around and hold new potential in their hearts for the expression of life anew. And for this, it's worth coming together again and again. And I hope that in a few decades we are sitting around a fire out in nature together, laughing together over the simplicity of the life that emerged from the chaos of a disconnected humanity and the speed at which it all healed. At the last moment, at the last step of biology on the planet, we suddenly took a step back from the cliff edge and we ran into a new field of flowers that are blooming in colors that had never been imagined before because the new genetics of the new earth are even more vibrant than the last and the eyes of the human in a decade will be brighter and more clear to the beauty around it than it is today. This is the potential of human shared space. And so thank you for what you do. Thank you for each of you listening right now because in the energetics of your listening in, like the moss next to us here, you reset the genetics of humanity. You reset the genetics of the moment by taking a pause from your life to listen into this conversation. And I hope that you are feeling the opportunity between the words to hear your own beauty, to feel your own truth, to realize that you have been waiting your entire life and maybe many lives before to come to this moment. And you can feel in you a massive exhale. My God, I don't have to run for some abstract horizon anymore. We've arrived, people. We got to the end point of an egoic human journey. The epoch comes to a close. Close your eyes and rest. Feel your toes, they're down there still. Start to connect your toes to the top of your head so that they might hear the original math of expression. Wiggle your toes. If that makes you realize they're trapped in shoes, take off your shoes. Wiggle your toes more. Spread them out. Monkey toe that thing. Expand. Bend the foot. Get the plantar fascia pumping. Massive movement of lymphatics. All of the toxins that you've consumed have settled by gravity into the base of your spine, into your toes. Mobilize all that. Get that stagnancy out. Spiral your ankles. God, that feels good. Move your ankles. Move your ankles. Get that going. Oh my gosh, you have calf muscles. That's pretty cool. Feel those calf muscles pumping, that huge gastrocnemius muscle. It's a big one. Feel how strong it is as you point your toes and then bring them back up towards your head. So much muscle, which is to say billions of cells moving along, actin, myosin sheaths, these little motors that run the microscopic level, a thousand times smaller, thinner than a human hair, billions of them moving along each other to create motion such that you would be the great pollinator of biology on Earth. You would move more botany around this planet to populate more beauty into its niches and crannies and everything else. Here we are, people, with legs, toes. So walk out into a field today. Walk out into the grass, into the wildflowers, into the snow, in your bare feet. Feel the shock of nature touching you directly through those feet. Connect nature to your original math, that vibrational being above you. Let it come pouring down through you right to the toes, right to speak to the snow or the grass or the flowers. Let the soil feel your presence. Here you are. I 
was recently in Africa and got to meet an amazing bushman from the Kalahari, one of the last. And he said to me that the way in which you call an elephant is you get down on your hands and knees and open up your heart and pour the vibration of love into the earth and the elephants will sense that through their feet many kilometers away and they'll come to you. The soil and the elephants that walk it will know your presence when you open yourself up to nature. You are here with 7.8 billion other souls in a great experiment of consciousness. And should we heal our relationship to nature, we may just set the entire universe in a new direction because we sit at a chakra center. We sit at an energetically unique place within this great universe to change the vibration of not just a, a far-flung planet in some deep space, but a deep vibrational center. And like the call of the blue whale, your heart could open and send new vibration into the cosmos that would reset the math of the whole matrix. So know you have toes. Get into that body. Express your original math before you go back into the soil. It'll be a life well lived for your awareness, for your listening. Tell me what you feel right now. I feel such a deep presence and interconnectedness to you, everyone and everything in this room, and a deep sense of purpose and clarity and knowing that there is hope. It's very possible that we can make the healing shift on this planet a living reality. That it's so possible. What part of your body are you feeling that in? I feel it pouring through my heart. Yeah. Which is to say which part of your body, if you were to just generally point to. <laughs> yeah, my chest. 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 It's in your chest. Where else do you feel a shift? A shift in my, my stomach. Yeah. Huge. Huge. Let's go ahead and start at the top of the head. Just tune into the top of your head out of mm. curiosity and just... There's no expectation on this little experiment, mm -hmm. but I'd invite everybody to do this. But we're gonna let you take us through this, Andre. Tell us what you feel at the top of your head as you really kind of tune in to the scalp right at the top. It's gonna be different for everybody. Uh, I feel sensations that I would describe as a spiraling open vortex. Beautiful. Uh, that's almost at the skin level you're feeling that. Or is it deep to that? I feel the sensation of buzzing vibrations. Perfect. Now let's just start the discipline of observing kind of centimeter by centimeter as we drop down. So now kind of you're, you're maybe behind your forehead there. What are you sensing in the center of your head, behind the forehead there? Uh, I feel a deep gravitational power and capacity to know. Such a relief. I was taught for decades that I had to learn it's a much different thing than knowing. Mm. You do have a gravitational center right there. And it is connected to all knowingness. All information in the universe is at play in this atomic space that we would call a human psyche. We have access to all the knowing. Let's drift down further now. Maybe right behind your eyes. What are you feeling there? I feel relief. 
Mm. I feel uh, an effortless, pleasurable experience, capacity to gaze and to see. Ah, it's such a relief to even hear the word relief there. What we might realize from that is that we have all been straining our eyes for decades, looking, perhaps centuries, looking to the horizon for a new future, looking to the horizon for hope outside of ourselves. The reason we're feeling relief behind our eyes is we just for a moment together stopped peering towards or over some future horizon and we just became present. And the eyes immediately relaxed, realizing that everything they'd been looking for was right here. What do you sense a little lower down behind the mouth? Mm. I feel the desire to powerfully reveal truth, the possibility of illumination. That is beautiful. The possibility of illumination. We're going to come back to that one when we get further down in the body. But remember at the mouth, the possibility of illumination. Move down into your throat there. The thyroid gland sits here. Your vocal cords sit here. And what's, what's down in the base of the throat there? It feels like the power and the source of the illumination and... connection for shifts externally and power source from within power source from within let's drift down a few more centimeters to the upper chest there behind the breastbone hmm. the bandwidth to feel the full spectrum, the feeling of aliveness and the gratitude for that. Mm. Let's drift down to the diaphragm, base of the lungs. Feel a uh, deep integration possibility for wholeness love, connectedness throughout my whole being and the potential for release. Let's go down to the belly button, deep to that belly button, the center of your abdomen, what's there? Feel a deep potential to be actualized. Feel a deep sense of power, of will, of knowing that I have the power to change worlds. Let's sink down to the floor of the pelvis. I feel my connection to the earth and the remembrance of my purpose to be a servant, a protector, a, an individual to foster and continue to protect this connection and remembrance for the rest of my energy centers that this is why we're here, that I'm grateful for this human experience, that I'm here to taste the full spectrum of this human body and spirit. And that I am held in ways that my mind can never perceive, that life has got me and that I'm safe. We're safe. Let's jump down to our feet, to our toes. What do we sense? 
sense and appreciation for the gift that's been given to feel and to walk and to have a sensation, the gratitude for that. And to be the change, to walk the walk. And it's through that embodiment that true change can be reflected in our external reality. So with our eyes closed, we're going to look back up to the pelvis from those feet. We're going to look back up there and imagine now your mind's eye traveling back up to the pelvis. It actually looks like a radar dish. It's this big dish. It's, it's the base of your torso, the foundation of your energetic center that's called the Dan Qian in Chinese medicine, this radar dish. Float up there, still looking towards the head and lay down like a hammock in the floor of your own pelvis and look upwards. As you look up through your own torso, up through the chest, up towards the neck, I'm going to take you through what you are seeing there. Can you see that bright, bright spot up in the center of the head? Mm -hmm. That bright spot is this very strange structure that functions as a lens of a film projector, a movie projector. The lens sits up there, and that bright spot is the light of the movie shining down right at you. You're actually laying now in the hammock of the screen on which that movie is projected. That lens is called the pineal gland, and it is centering this beam of light coming down, an organized energetic expression of the infinite that animates your biology is beaming down through that pineal gland and then projecting out to the, fill the entire pelvis by, on which you lay. The film is now playing on you. And the radar dish is shaped just perfectly to now project that tiny little beam that's now expanded to hit the pelvis straight up in a perfect cylinder through your being, your physical embodiment is now fully encased in this film that's being projected up through your biology to give you your original math, the original design, the original matrix by which your biology lined up to in the womb is here in the light form interacting with a column of water that is your biology. And the water is lit by this story, this narrative, this original math coming through, beaming up. And now as you lay in the hammock, looking up to your body, picture where that beam is now narrowing. Look at each rib section, almost like flying buttresses along the roof lines of a great cathedral. These ribs hold up the ceiling of that cathedral, founded on the foundation of your spine below. The flying buttresses come up and create this cathedral-like environment of your torso that's vibrating and filled with the whole light show of your original story that is playing out in your biology right now and in this lifetime. And it projects up and look how each rib gets narrower and narrower. The cylinder gets narrower and narrower as it comes up towards your neck. It's like looking into the mouth of a megaphone. It's getting narrower and narrower. And then that last rib sitting right at the top of the, of the chest, right at the top of the rib cage is just narrower than your neck. And it now has focused that beam of that cone of light down into a small beam shooting up to that last rib cage, now having echoed through the walls and ceilings of your cathedral. This light show now tightened back into a tight form moves through a very odd structure. It looks like a horseshoe floating in the middle of the neck. It's the strangest bone in the body. It's the only anatomical structure in my entire anatomy course 25 years ago in which the professor suddenly paused and said, we don't know what this thing does. I had been told what everything else in the body had, do, had to do, provide. This bone, we do not know what it does until you look at biology through the form of light. And that, that cylinder of light now tightened into a certain space shoots through the horseshoe, looks like a wishbone in the neck, 
just above the thyroid gland. It's called the hyoid bone. And it's unique because it does not have a joint to connect to any other bone. It floats instead in the middle of the fifth chakra, the fifth energy center of the body in which we communicate, from which communication comes, which means that this perpetual eon old information coming through this movie screen has the potential at the last moment before it projects out into the world to be tuned by you. Your human is allowed to shift the vibration of your narrative. The original math is about to be tuned in the last passage through your body before it hits the last structure that we can see from your floor of your pelvis, which is your hard palate, the roof of your mouth. As you look up from your hammock of your pelvis, you look up through there, and my God, that thing from that angle looks like a ski jump. It takes this vertical cylinder of light and suddenly puts it horizontal. And it comes shooting out of your mouth, a beam of truth, a beam of original math, a beam of original intent coming into the face of the lover across the table, of a child sitting on the other side of the meadow. Your biology was uniquely devised to allow for a perfect projection of an eternal energy, infinite in its nature, projecting into a finite moment that we would call a human body. It was designed to be heard. And there's 7.8 billion that have shown up right now to express something of source, something of beauty. So welcome to your body. Welcome to the expression of your infinite self. Have no fear that you know everything that you need to know. Have no fear that everything that you would want or need to express yourself fully in all of your beauty an impact on this earth right now at the tipping point of biology here, everything you would want or need or even imagine will come to that gravitational center that we experienced behind the eyes and we will fully illuminate that potential that we felt behind the mouth. As the hyoid bone changes its position, floating in your neck, it is the emotions of the moment that will ultimately shape the original math into a coherent narrative or story of who you are and why you're here. And so what emotion are you going to allow to be your final arbiter of truth? Which emotion will you let bend your message, your song, Will you let the fear bend your tune to hurt somebody near you again? Will you let guilt bend your tune so that you would be suppressed in your truth once more? Would you let shame bend your song once more so that you would diminish your role in the symphony? Or will you let joy and laughter ignite your song into something so infectious that the next pandemic cannot be stopped? A pandemic of joy, a pandemic of possibility, a pandemic of laughter, a pandemic of hugs. We're so damn close to the new expression of humanity. And y'all showed up right here, right now, to be a part of all that. Honored to be among you. Brother.
Father, thank you so much. Mm. Deep bow for how activating you are and your presence is. Mm. That was such a beautiful process. And as I've heard you share, Lynn Twist has that quote of, mm. there's nothing more powerful on a planet than an idea. That's time has come. And you just shared with us a deep gnosis and the time of an idea that has come. So thank you. Thank you for being a conduit and a channel for something so magnificent to come through. And it's desperately needed on this planet right now. And uh, I cannot wait for more of this. Where two or more souls are gathered, the divine will show up. Mm. So thank you for being the other half of the divine vessel for this to show up in. It's been an honor to be with you. I'm grateful for the moment. Thank you, brother. This podcast was psychedelic without <laughs> drugs. <laughs> <laughs> ah, man, for everybody that's been tuning in, thank you so much for tuning into the energy of this. And if you were able to join us for that guided experience towards the end, please share with us what your experience was, how that was activating for you, how you want to carry it forth, moving in your life, moving forward. Thank you coming on this journey of knowing thyself and we will catch you on the next one. Before we wrap up, Zach, is there anywhere else people can find you? Anything that you have going on that you want to share? Everything will be linked down in the description um, for where they can find you and things that you have going on. But um, any way that we can plug people into what you're doing, what you're creating, please, the floor is yours. Mm. Uh, I guess the immediate thing that comes to mind is all of our farmers that are suffering right now and loneliness. And so uh, with Farmers Footprint, there's an opportunity for you to connect to those farmers that are toiling on the soils of this earth right now to try to reimagine a different future. And they are being given an environment that stacks all the cards against them and, and asks them to take all of the risk for jumping out of the current paradigm and creating the new one. And so those farmers that are doing biodynamic, organic, permaculture, regenerative, whatever the terms they're using right now, are the most of intrepid of beings on the earth right now. And there are so many farmers right now that want to get into that game and need the support to get there. And so uh, tune in, farmersfootprint.us uh, for global message there. Uh, farmersprint.org.au for connecting to your Australian colleagues if you're listening in from that continent. Uh, we've got the UK and, and South Africa coming on quickly, New Zealand as well. So there will be a Farmers Footprint near you soon, but um, farmersfootprint.us can connect you to our, our documentary ser series, which is these short stories of farmers around the world that are doing radically good things to re reignite our relationship to nature. So become inspired there at farmersfootprint.us. If you want to see how beautiful things are under a microscope when you reconnect to nature, um, we've uh, my basic science laboratory has been studying the impact of the communication network of soil systems on human biology for the last decade or more. And uh, you can see all that science at intelligenceofnature.com. If you just want more education, more podcasts, all of that stuff, um, we have a Global Health Education Summit series that uh, is on my website as well, but that's ZachBushMD.com. Lots to be had there. And you can follow my social media if you feel like doing that. I'm not super active on that, but um, there's a lot of beauty that comes pouring through there. Every every Friday, for example, the, the global community sends in their, their hashtag breathe your biome images which are images of children and adults around the world that are um, finding themselves in nature again and finding their own beauty back in it. And the photos that are sent in for this series is so, so encouraging every week. I, I tune into my own <laughs> stream on Instagram every Friday night for, for the opportunity to start my weekends with a new sense of hope because the beauty that is flowing in in that stream is really beautiful. So uh, that's Zach Bush MD on Instagram, Facebook, et cetera. Um, you know, there's so many other projects that I would love to introduce you all to, but, you know, I, I feel inspired just to remind you all to, uh, acknowledge the moss, <laughs> you know, you're going to find so much more of yourself in there than you will anything I have to offer you. You're going to find so much more of your own hope in reconnecting to your source of nature than you will from finding me in the digital world. So 
it's going to be important for each of us to remember that connectivity is never going to come through these digital channels at the highest level. So if you need to, to tap back into the information stream so that you can feel that hope in your heart and retune, then please go to those avenues that I mentioned. Uh, but ultimately, I would ask you to really go out in nature and take off those shoes and feel your toes in the, in the moss and in the soil today. F smell the soil. We, we forget how good soil smells in its living form. So take a deep breath on the surface of the earth now and breathe in the 10 to the 30 viruses that are in the air around us that give us the new potential for a new expression of biology on this earth. Take a deep breath in and acknowledge the genetic intelligence of this earth and make yourself part of the continued experiment of the expression of human biology such that we might stay to play. Thank you so much. Appreciate you deeply. Deep bow. Until next time, we'll run it back. Aho. Aho, brother. <laughs>